Welcome everybody to Dope People, the community, the On The Revel family. Thank you guys for joining. Um, my name is Jacoby. I'll be your host today. I'm always joined by my lovely co-host and executive producer, Lulu Sway. Lulu, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm super excited about this episode. Um, it is dealing with all the women on the extraction and processing side of the house, which we don't hear about ever. Um, and I am really lucky to know these two amazing women from Washington State, um, my state that I came up with or came up on in cannabis. So I'd love to introduce to you, um, Nicole and Lowell. Uh, would you mind turning your cameras on, ladies? Amazing. So I have Lo Friesen, founder and CEO and chief extractor of Halo Cannabis, and Nicole Graff, founder, creative director, head of product development of Raven, um, and also author of Grow Your Own, uh, a book that is being sold on Amazon. So welcome, ladies. So excited to have you both here. Thank you on the Revel crew and shout out to Oscar. That was a killer set. So I would love if you- Sure. Oh. Um, if, I'm, if I'm delayed, that's my bad. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, what? Um, <laughs> Nicole and Lo, would you mind giving a quick two or three minute um, introduction about your you and your background? Sure. Um, I can, yeah, I can go. Um, hey, everybody, I'm Lo. I'm the founder of Halo. We're based in Seattle, Washington. Um, but my background is actually in chemistry and medicine. So um, I studied chemistry in school, worked in a chemistry lab, and then uh, moved on to working in medicine for a few years. And that was really where I got my access to understanding the medical benefits on a biochemistry level. Um, in terms of cannabis interacting with the human body and really believing in the incredible benefit that this plant can provide our community. And so um, I moved uh, out to Seattle in 2015 to pursue a career in cannabis. And by way of working through the extraction manufacturing side and helping with um, manuf the manufacturing and production of equipment to uh, founding Halo and helping people understand the chemistry of the products on the extraction side um, to help them find the right product for them. So our mission is to help anyone get more out of life with cannabis. And I, I truly believe that there is a product for every single person on this planet. It's really just understanding um, what chemistry fits with your body. So um, I'm really grateful to be here today. Thank you, Lulu, for highlighting this side of the industry because um, it's not it may not seem like the sexiest side from, from, you know, the outside, but once you look in, it's, it's one of the coolest, coolest parts of the industry. So I'm grateful to be here with Nicole as well, who I've worked with in the past. So take it away, Nicole. Thank you. Um, like Lo said, we've been working together actually since year one of both of our businesses. Um, I moved to Washington state in 2013 with one of my co-founders, Micah. Um, we had very different backgrounds that were not necessarily cannabis related. Um, he was in construction management and architecture, and I was working in fashion design. And our third business partner um, has been a grower his entire professional life since he was 17 years old <laughs> and is now in his 70s. So he brought the actual plant experience. Um, I had an herbal medicine and fashion background. My real interest is in how we speak about products, um, how we communicate to consumers about what we're doing in a less disingenuous way than I was seeing in the fashion industry, than I was seeing in really any consumer-based industry. Um, and we got into this as sort of an interesting hybrid of our two skill sets and wondering how we could use those skill sets to form a business that really changed the way that we had been seeing businesses you know, work in America. Um, we wanted to be able to create supply chains that were more responsible to the producers and processors and less reliant on manipulative language and marketing techniques to get consumers to be convinced to buy your products. Um, we just wanna be transparent about what we're doing, how we're doing it and why that is, and why we believe it's beneficial. So. I, I love that. I mean, you two are rare birds in cannabis. I can say like, I know maybe less than 15 um, women on this side of the supply chain. 
And then also, um, Lo, I think you're of one of three women that I've met in the cannabis space that actually has dealt with machinery. So um, I'm just super stoked that, you know, we always talk about, you know, there's lots of women in cannabis and there's a lot on the front of the house. But this episode um, or the series that we're doing is really important to kind of highlight behind the scenes because without you guys, without the growers and the formulators and the extractors and the, you know, the things that you guys do, there would be nothing to brand and there'd be no products to have. So thank you again for sharing your knowledge. Um, I think Jacoby's going to start with our series um, to learn more about, you know, your experience and how to prep our audience for um, extraction and processing. Yeah. Yeah. Really excited about this. Um, Extraction was actually, besides the actual plant, the first part that really drew me in to the actual business of cannabis. Uh, I saw these guys just like pouring out slabs of just like fresh butane um, <laughs> that needed to be heated up. And I was like, what is this gold? I got to figure this out. So I'm really excited about this topic. Um, before we get started, um, I just do want to comment on all of our audience, the people that join us. We can't do it without you. So we have some people in Zoom today. What's up? We love you guys. Thank you for coming every time. Or if it's your new time, if it's your first time, welcome. Um, but also thank you to the people on YouTube. If you're watching on the YouTube live stream, we appreciate you. Uh, press the like or subscribe to our channel. Um, I know that New York is heating up. I know that very well. Some craziness going on with Cuomo. I don't know how it's going to shake things up. But if you want to get involved, um, I hope that you are supporting Murda, uh, which is the bill that's much more equitable than the CRTA. Uh, I'm going to put a link inside of the chat to, to support it and kind of push that forward. But also uh, for all the entrepreneurs that are in New Jersey um, trying to make waves, um, there's a lot going on. And I want to give a special shout out to our sponsor, Cole Shots. Uh, they've been a, a, a phenomenal partner. And if you are trying to get in the cannabis industry anywhere, but especially in New Jersey, you need to go talk to these guys. Uh, I'll also add the link there. So let's get to this panel. Really excited about it. Our first topic is going to be on how did you guys get started, right? It sounds basic, um, but we know that there is a lot of legwork that goes into actually getting the application, actually winning the application and getting a license. And then you actually have to build the facility, right? And there's tons of capital involved. There's all these crazy machines. Some of them I understand. Some of them, they look like Bill Nye's contraptions. Um, so that's where we want to start. Okay. So you guys had an idea and a dream. You saw an opportunity. Can you walk us through how you took that from an idea? Um, let's just say up to a winning application, then we'll get to construction. Why don't you start us off, Lo? Oh, sure. Um, well, I uh, will say that Washington's license process is a little bit simpler than some other states, especially limited license states. So I have experience in helping other people with applications, but in, in Seattle, it was, I had to actually buy a license, buy a license that was already established. I'm sure Nicole was um, a, a different process, but I came in a little bit later. And so you have to find in Washington, you have to find a license that's already been granted and then buy that license. So I found myself in a unique and really opportune situation um, to get my license in, at, uh, for Halo. But I also went through about a four year process um, in Ohio with my family getting started there. And that license process was brutal. I mean, it takes your entire self and multiple team members with a wide range of experience to be able to write an application that is hefty enough, robust enough, and calling out every single rule while also not just reciting the rule. So there's so much that goes into writing a solid application for states like um, Ohio or Illinois, for example. And so it actually costs a lot to even write the application and um, file applications in those states. And then on top of that, are um, in many states, if you are not on top of the scoring process, I've heard many times over, including our own application, getting misscored, and we had to go back and uh, basically prove that we had the right answers in there. And so um, 
it, it, it's a multi-year process. And so um, it's a tough one for people, especially if you're seeking investment, because it's something that is uh, a little bit uncertain and also takes a long time to even get started. And then, and so it, it's extremely complicated, but I'm, I'm grateful that Seattle was a little bit simpler. Um, and so I'll let Nicole uh, take a little bit more detail in terms of the Washington state license process. Yeah, we actually had a much different process because we were one of the ground floor applicants. So it was that tricky point where you need to show that you have all of your capital secured for your first, I think it was your first two years of operating expenses or something. Um, but in order to show that capital, your investors want to see a license in hand, right? They don't want to invest in something that you can't show them. And the other piece of that was we had to have a location to do business um, we had to be leaseholders or, you know, property owners before they would grant us the license. But again, trying to find a landlord who's going to let you do business in an as yet still illegal um, industry on site and undertake that risk with things being federally illegal was super challenging. So for us, it was definitely making relationships at the city and county level, learning your zoning restrictions inside and out. So when things come up that are bigger than you, you've got an answer ready. Um, and making friends there who can give you just straight non-cannabis answers to problems. I think that was the biggest thing was like demystifying the application by taking the cannabis piece out of it and trying to treat it like any other business application would be. Um, and that's, that's sort of the best piece of advice I have is just take it piece by piece and calmly and set yourself aside enough working capital so that you don't stress out about the fact that it's taking a year when it should have only taken four months and it's going to take exponentially longer than you think it's going to and just plan on that um, so you don't have to stress about it. Did you guys work with a lawyer with your application or a um, cannabis applicant group at all or was this kind of you guys powered through it on your own? We had two attorneys. We had two sets of attorneys for different issues, um, but wound up not really involving either of them in the license writing process. But again, because it was early days, we didn't know. Um, we didn't know what would come up. We didn't know if, you know, state and federal were going to have lawsuits that would come up that would try and prevent us in different municipalities, preventing us from getting licenses within those. Um, so I think it's great to have on reserve, um, keep an attorney on retainer but we wound up not using ours and we wrote the application ourselves. We didn't use, didn't use any consultants because again, at the time there wasn't really anyone. Yeah, we actually did end up per, uh, working with a consulting group for our Ohio application because of how many uh, aspects we had to cover that we needed to be absolutely sure we could handle the whole application. Um, and so, uh, we did lean on a consulting group and also absolutely recommend having an attorney that is either already experienced in the cannabis space or absolutely, or willing to put in the work it takes to dissect the rules and regulations. And, you know, Nicole mentioned, um, creating a network or, or, you know, having friends and creating relationships throughout different aspects of the industry on top of the zoning and local and uh, state regulators, um, because at any moment in time, the regulations can change or they'll add something to the application that you need to change or add on at any point. So um, I, I find that having the, the network and groups like on the revel, like having a community that you can reach out to and ask these questions to, or can give you a, a notice about potential changes down the line is vital for being able to keep up. Definitely, and when you're seeking help from people in other states too, making sure they're well-versed in operating outside of their own state. Um, I know a lot of times I'll get unsolicited advice from California friends being like, oh, you should just, and I'm like, yes, no, I would love to just do that, <laughs> but that's not <laughs> a Washington thing. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of times we all get very tunnel visioned about how complex our own situations are. Um, and trying to remember to zoom out from that. And that's a big part of like how we started our business from day one was understanding that there's a lot of uncertainty in each state as they make their decisions, but also trying to keep this long game vision going of, 
okay, but eventually with federal legalization, we want to be on board with how things are going to eventually go. So down to, you know, why we chose doing CO2 extraction versus the other available methods, because, and I'm below, I'm sure you're the exact same way. We knew that eventually that's going to be, you know, the path of least resistance for federal legalization. So we wanted to be very well versed in that practice from day one. I echo everything you just said and want to emphasize the um, kind of play, not not necessarily like playing a long game, but really thinking about the future and what that could look like. And there's a lot of different uh, directions it can go into, but creating a business that's going to be able to pivot and, um, you know, having those future standards in mind as you build your facility, create a brand, choose your solvents, like all of these, even what part of the industry you want to be part of will um, help set yourself up for success because this, you know, starting a business is hard. Starting a business in cannabis is 20 times harder. And so if you can think ahead and really like understand um, what the future could hold, it will help you make better decisions right now. And I think really being strong in who you are as a business and as a collective within your team and why you're doing what you're doing. If you're just getting in to chase market trends and do it because cannabis is hot right now, you're gonna have a really wild ride and like not good. <laughs> it's, it's a really volatile industry and there's really harsh lows and really high highs. But if you have, you know, kind of an inner driving ethos um, that's helping you make these decisions aside from all that noise, um, I think it really helps you withstand the storm a lot more and that, reactive. And that also um, applies to like your investors and who you seek support from, because if you are not aligned, then it makes every challenge really hard. So um if everybody, you know, you have to, it, it's a tough process to go through, but you have to be aligned, every single person involved. Yeah, I think that's a good pivot, actually. And I know we're getting there eventually. Um, but like managing investor relations, especially within cannabis is such a specific thing. Because so many people have heard tales of these high returns in the cannabis industry and getting them to understand that those high returns are in really specific roles within really specific markets. And they don't apply to the industry as a whole, and they don't apply to every state as a whole, and they don't apply to every role within the market. They don't apply to organic farmers. Um, they don't apply to craft extractors. Um, and that's something that we spend a lot of time, you know, fighting for legislatively and, you know, structurally within the industry. But it's something that we try and stay really transparent with our investor team about because that can be a huge stress component is, you know, you set these margins for yourself based on what we think an industry is gonna look like. And not only is, you know, it's a new thing, so it's changing, but yeah, every state as new states come on, pivot to try and adjust their market to catch up with other states and you get this butterfly effect of runoff to deal with. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's interesting that we, we in New York have a, a medical, um, cannabis right now, which is actually all solventless. And I don't want to go into the actual types yet. I'm sure we'll get into that. But um, we have a large audience that is trying to figure out what's their next play going to be. So when you guys were doing that early research, right, you have some tips of like, make sure your investors are all aligned, make sure you get your zoning restrictions. But how are you doing this planning before you got your license? Like, were you looking at research or um were you doing product development on the low like how did you start to plan what you were going to do before you actually had it um a license especially especially you nicole right like you guys are so early i don't even know if they had market well, reports then washington had um a medical market which we were a part of and which our grower had been a part of for many years. Um, but no, there was no like market research on legal cannabis. There were a lot of projections that were based on nothing. Um, and we based a lot of our projections on like traditional retail markups. Um, weirdly, <laughs> actually our projections were 
pretty accurate as far as costs, our costs and the cost to consumer. But the one thing that we didn't take into account was the way Washington structured their licenses was we're not allowed to have vertical integration. So they put a limit on the number of retail stores that could exist, not on the number of producers and processors initially. Um, so the retail stores are the ones who control the retail margins. So we had no control over that. And it's just not something we would have seen coming that a retail markup within this specific industry would be so different than any other traditional retail model. So it it really spun our, you know, our margins much lower. <laughs> um, and we wouldn't have known until getting into it. So every year it's, you know, readjustment, readjustment. But we were definitely doing product research and product development early on, um, not just based on cannabis at all necessarily, but I do have an herbal herbalism background and doing traditional herbalism extractions, herbal medicine formulations, um, basing our, our product you know, planning on that, and then getting into the extraction process and training on that from the medical market was a really different thing too, because the people who were training us on this equipment had a totally different end goal than we do. You know, they wanted to just maximize yield. They wanted to maximize weight. And that's not what we were interested in at all, which we can get into later. But yeah, it's interesting to, again, like, okay, what are the products we want to make and why? And then troubleshooting how you can do that in a perfect world. And then as you learn more about the regulations that are coming down the pipeline and re-pivoting, re-pivoting, re-pivoting as you go. And, um, you know, while Nicole or someone entering the market like very early on didn't have really the resources that, uh, you know, traditional business or traditional industries have today, we are getting there. And I think that there are enough states that are legal and even have been medical for a long enough time that you can actually look at those market trends. And I have a colleague who works for Headset Data who um, gets to see, you know, all the back end data. And she is saying how you can literally overlay like the trends from every single state and see how in line the timelines are. So it's just true that um, each state is its own ecosystem, but it goes through the same timeline um, in terms of consumer demand and trends and things like that. Now there are like little niche hot trends in each market, but um, for the most part, like the general trends, like what consumers are buying and what portion of each market is um, uh, of the market share based on product type, those all will align. And so um, for, oh, go ahead, Nicole, you look like- you're... I was just gonna say, I do feel like one thing that is really important to keep in mind though, especially with small business entrepreneurs is how your initial industry is structured is going to really change how many small businesses are left after the culling that happens. And yes, you know, Consumer education absolutely plays a huge role in as products come online, you know, consumers get savvy and, you know, you'll see trends in actually, you know, buying, but especially in Washington and California, you see these huge culling periods come where small businesses can't survive the consolidation that's coming in without things like, you know, processor cooperatives that can set price floors. Um, so we don't have huge buyouts coming from these big companies as they come in, especially with, again, federal legalization looming and big states looking to small states to you know, influence how those industries are structured from the ground up. So I think just trying to be as aware as you can as a small business owner of how friendly your particular market is gonna be long-term to small businesses. I love that. And Oh, go, go ahead. It, no, please. Oh, I was just going to say that um, with all of that in mind, you know, having the data that we have now, you know, using that as kind of like a guideline or validating what you're trying to do. But fundamentally, it comes down to like, how do you want to operate your business? Are you going to be the low margin, high volume product? Because, you know, there's room on the shelf for that. Granted, it is one of the hardest <laughs> ways you can enter this industry hard um or are you sorry go ahead what was that hard and reactive because you always have to be yeah, able to... exactly yeah and some people are down to do that and sure um but uh what we're finding in terms of sustainability not you know going beyond like what we should be operating sustainably for the earth 
but also as businesses, you know, knowing who we are, knowing the audience that we're trying to reach and, um, you know, holding true to that, uh, that vision is, is really important. And so this is where it comes down to like building your foundation off of that, because that will dictate every decision you go going forward. Um, and so choose your path if it's one or the other, because, um, DV, you know, having to like pivot that far into something is really hard, especially going from a low margin, high volume product to trying to get into to craft. It's just a completely different business model. Well, and banding together with like-minded people, you know, go to right. the like workshops, get on the zoom workshops, not even for the content itself, but to see who else is there and to hear what they're saying and how they're describing their businesses. And if that resonates with you, connect with those people because you're, you're the foundation of the entire industry within this state, which is going to be the entire region of that industry within the country when things go federal. And these are the people who are not just shaping what products look like, not just shaping what businesses look like, but shaping what regulations look like within that industry. Um, and getting to know one another and getting to, yeah, know one another's values and banding together early on so you can actually have a coherent voice um, because you'll get steamrolled otherwise by other people who from the beginning, you know, are paying attention to that stuff and, and making decisions one way or another. Um, so, And um, with that, like, I think I came into this not... Uh, this is such a new industry and every state is building their program. And so understanding that your voice actually does matter at this stage and at every stage of growth, like even every year, our community, our cannabis industry in Washington state comes together and goes to meetings and make sure that we all understand how we want it to move forward. And we might have differences of opinions, but we at least have the dialogue and um, finding the resources to be able to call somebody up and say, hey, you know, am I looking at this right? You know, how do we want this to go? Um, and in other states like Ohio, we're, we're having the same, you know, it's, it, but you have to foster that type of um, community and that type of industry because otherwise it is just the loudest voices that get to control how the program is set up. Exactly. That's why yeah. it's is so crucial. Like what you guys are doing is just, unprecedented and I so wish we had something like this when we were starting to connect us all well I appreciate it we're grateful to have expert women pave the way um I want to just comment quickly on um well a ton of things you said but I'm going to narrow it down one of which was kind of like the market design and the way that it's it's set up from the beginning that might be more or less advantageous for small businesses or more equitable and in YouTube world, nine months from now, this is probably an irrelevant point, but because it's such a hot topic right now in New York, I just can't stress enough that if this is important to you as people that are watching this, you need to go support the MRTA. We'll add links to this, but the design of the way the, the infrastructure for how the market works has such great implications on the opportunities that are to everybody else. Um, on that note, I'm going to ask one more question on this, like getting up to speed for your business. And I have to ask it, how did you guys get funding, right? Like getting funding in general is hard. Getting funding for cannabis is extremely hard. Getting funding as women is also especially hard. So I want to understand how you guys have like climbed up this ladder against all the odds. And also you must be crazy to even try it. And also like you guys killed it. Right. So how, how, how did you guys get your money? Where did it come from? What are some things we can learn from? Lo, do you want to go first on this? <laughs> sure. Um, uh, friends and family. Um, so I like poured my savings into just obtaining the license. And then I worked with friends and family to um, basically help me with uh, by way of equipment. So there's a really, um, first of all, I also recommend on top of legal to also work with an, like an accounting firm or somebody who's experienced in like the finance management of a cannabis company, because there's, there are a lot of limitations in terms of taxes for cannabis companies. And that could be a whole series in itself. Um, but having somebody to help you. <laughs> yeah. 
um, structure your business. How do we structure the business? What assets should be in what companies, you know, and really understanding the structure and how to optimize each uh, asset is really important. And so um, this is a roundabout way of saying that basically we have the asset of the one company, which is the cannabis company that owns the license and then another company that um, owns the equipment. And with that, you know, we've secured the equipment separate from the cannabis company. And then also um, you're able to get funding a little bit easier because financing equipment is like on the manufacturing side, super, super common. And so if you can kind of create a level of separation from the cannabis company, it does give you access to more opportunities. But for me, fortunately, I was able to go through private financing and basically do, uh, do it through friends and family, which also created um, support from that network because my, you know, our collective success means you know, the sustainability of this business and that the investors will get their return. So working with the right people with clear expectations in terms of like the timeline of, of the whole uh, growth of the business, um, it, it made the, the conversations a little bit easier and the terms more favorable. Yeah, um, ours was a little bit trickier because in the beginning, um, the idea of us doing this came from a few people who were involved pretty heavily in the traditional market and in the medical market. And they were looking for a way to get into the recreational market, um, which seems like a very logical path that now we're talking openly about. But at the time, um, was really not a favorable path to take. And Washington was really not friendly um, to traditional market growers getting into the rec world. So they wanted to rebrand the image of the cannabis industry. They really didn't want that, that dirty money coming into their industry, um, not realizing that like, that's the world. That's the world we've been living in. And if you wanna keep it out, it'll stay outside and it'll keep thriving um, as, we, as we know. So, that was, that was what set us up to do this. Um, and then as we got in the process, it became really clear that there wasn't a path forward with that. And we did have you know, multiple legal teams who we were really transparent with being like, we're trying to get you know, a few people above board here um, and take them with us. And they were just like, they can't come. If you wanna have a business, they can't come with you. Um, and so that became the answer. And then we we're like, well, shit, <laughs> part, part of my language, but we don't have any money anymore. Um, and it became this crazy hustle of friends and family. And, you know, as we had gotten into it and started the application and we were like, we really believe in what we're doing. Like, this is what we're trying to do is important. And what the state just did is pretty fucked up and not okay. And um, we want to create a system that's helping communities not excluding communities. And so we fought really hard to make that case to a lot of people really quickly um, and drum up the funding that we needed just for phase one. We got lucky that again, with our particular skill set, we were able to do all of our build out ourselves. We were able to really scrap a lot together, um, really, really um, with low numbers, lower numbers than I don't, I really don't understand how we did it. <laughs> um, yeah, we got very lucky. And again, same thing. We were really transparent with our investors about the kind of business we were trying to create. And if we couldn't do that, um, then it, you know, there's no point in overpromising and creating a life of stress of under delivering. Um, that's, that's not why we're doing this, right? We're doing this to live out in the open and be transparent about what we're trying to build. So if you can't do that and you have to, you know, I hear friends in California right now getting really afraid of jumping into bed with these shark investors and, you know, having to like cater that to them, this image that they're hoping to see of an ideal investment. And that is really scary to me. Um, you're setting yourself up to just be beholden to these really unrealistic interests of an investor class that doesn't understand what's going on on earth. Um, so that's my advice is don't do that. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to wrap up this section, but what I'm taking away amongst a bunch of bars over here is absolutely know the people that you're working with and build those meaningful relationships and making sure you guys are seeing eye to eye on the vision. Because if you guys are misaligned there, all of that hard work, all of the effort writing the license, all of your skill sets don't really matter if the business isn't going to be successful. And I think that's like the number one thing I'm taking away from that. 
Um, okay, our next piece, we have talked about how we're going to get up and running. Now we're going to switch over to you're up and running now. Okay, walk me through your products and how do you actually make them? And what happens in those first 60 days when you're like, okay, cool, we had this great idea. We're going to get a machine. We're going to blast it through and make that product. What are the things that um, we're just not thinking about? You don't learn until you become an operator. I um, I definitely recommend uh, figuring out which products you're trying to create prior to choosing equipment um, because that really will help fundamentally uh, drive your business. So I am aligned with Nicole in that I look to the future and I was like, CO2 is going to continue to be the safest, the cleanest, the most versatile, the most selective solvent to, to use um, in extraction. And so um, I, I still believe that, but it, it does, it's, it's not the high volume, low margin product route, I would say. And so there's multiple solvents you can choose from. And so uh, you have ethanol, you have the hydrocarbons, CO2 solvent lists, which would be like using heat and pressure to extract. Um, but uh, building a facility out kind of, even if you have investment, being scrappy is really important because you can spend a lot of money really quickly. And so, uh, you know, do your due diligence, talk to customers of uh, suppliers that you're looking to. Um, and then, uh, you know, be as scrappy as you can be. Uh, and so once you've decided a solvent, then you can start refining your processes. And to date, I think a lot of the equipment suppliers are supporting their customers with at least like a, a starter method. So um, we've come a long way since the beginning, um, but it is still really challenging to enter this, this space after doing all this work and spending all this money and not having the opportunity to do R&D before licensure. Like you have to have a license in order to import cannabis product to actually be doing your product development. And so you, you do need to build that time in or you can hire a consultant. I know Nicole and I both, both do that. To, and really it's just to try to help people get started as quickly as possible. Because again, it's really easy to spend a lot of money and it's really easy to waste a lot of time and time is money. And so, you know, look to uh, your network to see if somebody can support you to get to where you need to be quicker. But, um, you know, just having that planned out. And so as far as um, how do you get the products to, uh, to the shelf. Um, Nicole grows and sorry for taking up so much time, but uh, we, we actually focus purely on extraction at this point. And so we have created a, a solid network of growers that are aligned with us in values. So sustainability is at its forefront, um, growing in a clean manner. So without using pesticides and, um, and then also growing uh, basically um product that we would want to see in a vape cartridge. And so Halo, the products that we make are vape cartridges using CO2. Um, and so we start with that flour material that you see on the shelves. Um, and then we grind it up, put it in the extraction system, and then using the, the solvent interaction, um, we extract the extract from the plant, and then we refine it through multiple processes, which end up creating that extract that you would see in a vape cartridge. And so our process is, um, is built out to uh, respect the plant and optimize the chemistry that comes from the flower. So we are not the, you know, the most THC in the smallest amount of time for the cheapest amount of money. That's not what we do because we really believe in the experience of the product. And that comes down to preserving the profile from the plant. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to do that. And uh, we, we've just found the one that works for us. Yeah, I mean, for us, that's, you know, why we've worked with Lowe in the past is because we align with that mentality of whole plant medicine. And for us, when we built our product catalog, because we don't just do extraction, um, we do smokes, which are, you know, pre-roll joints. We do our flour, which is our first product. Then we do a CO2 extract um, that we do in-house. And then we send out for some post-processing, we do a partial winterization process, which is what enables us to put it into vape cartridges. And that's where 
Lo helped us out. Um, and then we take our raw extract and we sell that both as a dabable or, you know, we have medical patients who are using it to homogenize into edibles, into other types of consumable oil, like in Rick Simpson oil type product. Um, and then we take that and infuse it into a raw organic coconut oil as well that can be used, you know, we say um, any way on or in your body that feels good to you is the legal verbiage we have chosen. Um, but for us with our product catalog, we really started with like, what's our main ethos here? Our main ethos is we believe in the medicine of this plant, this species of plant. So what are the products that we wanna create that best allows us to get that medicine to the consumer? Well, flour, we wanna grow organically grown live earth flour, that's a priority. We also want it in an easy consumable method, you know, a grab and go lower price point item. We also want to monetize some of our waste material, some of our keef and trim that comes off the plants. Well, that's where the smokes came in. So we need pre-roll equipment in order to do that. Then, you know, we have more waste material that can be turned into an extract product, um, small buds and, you know, Again, keep material that comes off in trimming, all of that can be turned into extract. What form of extract, again, now aligns with our ethos of whole plant medicine, the least refined. Um, we look to the regular herbalism market. Whole plant medicines are using CO2 to make their essential oils, to make their plant medicines. Why would we deviate from something that is already a beautifully set precedent within the world that makes high quality medicine? Um, but with all of that, I think the thing to drill home, especially at this point in the market, is do market research. <laughs> like, get to California, get to Washington, get to Oregon, get to every state that has solid ground under it and try products. And try products who you like the sound of their brand. Try products that you don't like the sound of their brand and see what they're doing. Try BHO, just because you have to, because you have to know you know, what you're up against and you have to know why people buy it and talk to bud tenders, get in there and ask them, you know, what sells and why and what they use personally and start asking smart questions so you can make smart decisions about your business um, based on those. And don't try and operate in a vacuum. In the beginning of all of this, you know, traditional market was very much like, don't look over here, don't look at what I'm doing, like you focus on you. And we have to be able to share information with one another. The science is moving just as fast as the economic models with all of this. And we have to keep one another abreast of what's happening. So we as an industry can grow our language, can grow our educational support systems and can grow our product standards to be able to keep up with what's happening, not just you know, from state to state, but also worldwide. You know, Israel's got some great things happening within their cannabis market and I don't want um, us to fall behind just based on, you know, everybody keeping their head down and trying to make a buck and not trying to further the industry as a whole with what we're producing. And the other part I will say about that with your market research is find out what you like and ask, like reach out to the company directly and ask what they're using. Um, like we stayed out of the pre-roll game for a long time because all the pre-rolls were shit <laughs> that we were seeing and they would fall apart and they would run. And it took a long time for someone to come up with a machine I could do it properly. So don't rush and just buy the first thing you see that gets the job done. Collaboration. I love that. Collaboration is key. Lulu harps on that all the time. In every single meeting, we're always talking about how we can collaborate with people. Lulu. I want to just clarify one quick thing for our audience because you guys just blew past it. Um, BHO, um, CO2, and... Um, I don't think you talked ethanol. about it. You can maybe use water. Ethanol. Yep, oh, ethanol, yeah. um, coconut oil. In New York currently, um, the medical market only, I believe, allows uh, like rosin pressing. Mm -hmm. So can just one of you just give like the quick overview of like the hydrocarbon versus pressure, like just actually how you're making these things? Sure. <laughs> so... Um, each one is different, uh, but uh, CO2 and hydrocarbons all use temperature and pressure to um, basically have the solvent interact with the plant material in a way that's going to dissolve the desirable components. And so um, they each have their pros and cons. Um, and so BHO is a really fast method and it, it is 
does optimize for like a what people think might be like a more flavorful profile but um what it really is is it, it's selective to some of the lighter flavors so and then whereas co2 is actually um a more um complex uh flavor profile because it's extracting more of the chemicals that are giving you that experience from cannabis so that's the terpenes and the cannabinoids on top of some other things and then ethanol is so so uh so uh, efficient that it's extracting a lot of the cannabinoids out and um is less selective and then uh the solventless methods like water for example is focusing on um the trichomes and extracting the trichomes from the plant. So those are the glands that hold the cannabinoids. And then um, rosin pressing you mentioned or uh, using a press, that's similar to like uh, pressing olive oil where you're using um, pressure like two plates and you're like squishing the plant. And what squeezes out using a little bit of temperature as well um, is this extract that um, that uh, collects, or sorry, that's that's in the glands of the plant. And so each, each one of them has their purpose. And that's why we talked about how knowing what your product will be at the end is important to um, selecting your solvent and your extraction method. Yeah, another thing to touch on with that, especially at the beginning of these industries was there was a lot of BHO that already existed because it was a very accessible method. Same with ethanol extraction. It was very um, friendly to doing at home. Um, to invest in a CO2 extractor was $100,000 and you had to, you know, have the facilities. This is another thing to touch on that we didn't really in the previous question was, especially if you're going with CO2, or using any of these flammable hydrocarbons as extractants, um, you need to have a facility that's up to code to be able to accommodate for that. Um, and for us, at least, if we wouldn't have gone with CO2, the, the sprinkler system upgrades and everything, it was like another $50,000 added to our build out. So that just wasn't even something we could do if we had wanted to um, based on hydrocarbon extractions. So. But to like uh, really simplify the extraction process, I usually compare it to like French press coffee because that in itself is an extraction. You're using water to extract the coffee and the caffeine um, and then you're pressing out the, the grounds. So it's, that's a much simpler way to understand how the um, extract is coming out of the plant. Are there certain other relationships that you need to court um, because you are doing, you know, something on the chemical basis of extraction and processing. We need a um, relationship with a fire marshal. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> to get them to and, understand that CO2 puts out fires and does not cause right. them. Um, because, yeah, they wanted to have zoning restrictions so that initially when the market started, we couldn't do CO2 in our facility. So again, knowing what you're doing so you can explain it to these city and county officials who are making decisions based on businesses they don't really understand. That it's you know new science to them. So being able to be an advocate for what you're actually trying to do as a business is really important. Yeah, ha having a, um, a chemistry background absolutely helped me kind of like catch up a little bit faster um, than if you didn't have a background. And also helps with like innovation and a process development, making things more efficient. And so while I never say that having somebody on the team that has a chemistry background is necessary to success, I will say that it is um, really helpful in creating like collaborative and because in, in chemistry, we're very used to working as teams and, and pulling from different, you know, departments to really understand um, how we can be better uh, and that's something that's not been part of the industry for a really long time. So um, I, I would say, though, that having a chemistry background is really helpful to refining the, the extraction process and, and the product development side. Or having someone with a chemistry background help you as a consultant setting up yes. your <laughs> Also that. Um, but uh, one thing that you mentioned, Nicole, was um, that... that uh, you know, it seems like going with like a hydrocarbon solvent or even ethanol might be 
like the cheaper route or the more like the lower barrier to entry. But the reality is that with regulations going forward, um, you're going to be facing a lot of expense to accommodate these solvents like ethanol or butane because of the, the class one D one um, uh, federal code, you know, in, in fire code, I, I don't know what it's called, but um, all the regulation, you know, sparkless, everything, everything you need to do to prevent the accidents that we witnessed from home extraction using these methods. And so just keep that in mind as you do, um, you know, build your team and, and your facility. Well, and as you touched on, building sustainable businesses that are environmentally friendly and not relying on hydrocarbon extraction from the earth to, you know, run your business as much as possible. I'm going to make one quick statement um, before we turn it over to our audience questions. But I think one thing that really sets both of you apart um, is the, the investment that you guys do in education. Um, I know Nicole at Raven, you guys have created your own kind of strain dictionary and effects categories. Um, and Lo, you know, when I first met you and came to visit the facility, you were showing me kind of a way that you guys are doing um, kind of like uh, helping people educate themselves on dosage and effects. And you guys have even created like specific uh, Spotify playlists that go along with your strains. So um, I just want to, you know, say that's kind of really amazing because right now, you know, to us who've been here, we're kind of in this echo chamber, but to the rest of the world, um, the rest of the US, it's still very new. So I think, you know, I applaud you guys for putting all of that work to really help educate people because this is still a nascent industry and we're still learning. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, and, you know, I can't wait to go through all of your playlists, Lo. <laughs> There's, it's awesome that you even have a matching one. Um, but I'm gonna, yeah, so, so thanks, ladies. Thank you. Um, yeah, education is really important. It's definitely not the easiest route in terms of um, marketing, uh, but it's, it feels right because um, we have to remember that so many people, most of this country has never experienced cannabis and does not know what it feels like. And so I, I always reference the fact that many of us have grown up, you know, as kids seeing how alcohol affects our friends and family or, you know, what it, what it means to take Advil, for example. Um, but so many people have no idea what cannabis feels like. And so we really have to not only break down the stigma that's associated with this plant, but also help people understand what it can feel like and how to use the product in a way to get them to where they want to be. And so um, education is it very, very important to the progression of this industry. And so um, while, you know, we have to kind of like work with the network and, and talk to bud tenders and really understand what people are looking for in, in our community, we also have to think about like, what do we want people to experience with this plant and starting with that because um, we are starting at ground zero for a lot of people. I have uh, one other question that we haven't touched on that I know is a big pain for all manufacturers is you guys actually need to track everything from the biomass all the way to the finished product. Now, I know this because I spent a lot of time in the software world of cannabis, and it was a nightmare. More power to the people that still do it. But can you just kind of explain, first of all, how do you even track something that is a flower that is now in a jar that's being sold to consumers? Can, like, can you guys explain how you guys do that at your companies and in general? It's very annoying. Um, when we first read the regulations, um, my grower's response was, I'm not doing that. And I was like, well, that's, <laughs> that's actually not an option that we have, <laughs> like, we have to do it. Um, but every plant, once it gets to a certain height has to be barcoded. Um, and from there, once they're harvested, you get to amortize a certain amount of weight into one lot. So now it goes from every plant being barcoded to all those barcodes combined into one. 
as it's drying and your flower material gets one barcode, your trim material gets another barcode. Um, and then as those things are turned into end products, as they're weighed into jars, every jar gets a barcode. As they're turned into extract, every batch within a certain weight allotment gets a barcode. Um, once that is turned into an edible, <laughs> all of that batch gets a barcode. So in theory, yes, everything from, you know, your cookie can be traced back to the actual seed that grew the plant that went into that cookie in theory. Yeah, it, it, it is annoying, um, but I am a little bit grateful for the fact that we have a system in place to do this because if we think ahead um, to like natural supplements or, you know, other industries like food manufacturing, you have to be able to track and trace all these things. In fact, in some of those industries, it's even more strict than what we experience. And, um, and so I think it's important to have, to emphasize that, or sorry, embed that into your company culture that tracking is just something we have to do. But beyond that, it's valuable because um, let's say we have to do a recall we need to be able to track everything down and figure out where it came from or what issue we encountered and how, how far back it goes and how many different batches it might have impacted. And so um, from that standpoint, I think that it's important to understand the function of it. I will say that it costs a lot of money for the state to put a program like that together and they may not choose the right partners to create the programs. Um, we've experienced a lot they of issues along the way. They don't choose the right partners. <laughs> yes, oftentimes they do not. And we spend millions of dollars working around a system that doesn't function the way it should. And ultimately we are responsible for making sure that everything's accounted for. So but That's, I will say it's like entry point advice for people looking to get into the cannabis industry, a very non-sexy, but very crucial role in every company, um, especially, um, not even especially, every company um, is someone who's a compliance person and who can make mm -hmm. sure top to bottom that your barcodes are getting entered properly, that plans are getting tagged when they hit a certain height. And someone who's actually paying attention to what's changing within the regs to keep you compliant because within the first three years, especially, things are gonna change um, from seed to sale, as they say, with you know, barcoding regulations up to packaging regulations and making sure you have the correct verbiage on every jar to keep you compliant. Um, and low, especially if you've not just from the public safety standpoint, as you were saying with a recall, but to protect you legally, since you didn't grow that product, if there's a consumer safety concern at the bat, at the front end and you're tracing back, you know, being able to parse out whose product came in where is super important to protecting your business. Yes, absolutely. I have yeah. one more question before, one last one before we call on you, Andrew. Um, one thing we haven't really talked about is testing. Um, mm. how, so how did you pick your testing labs? Do you kind of pick a bunch and you send product out there or, you know, is there someone specific that you work with? Like, how did that come about? Do you want to take this one first? Cause we've been through quite a few and there's been a lot of trial and error. And, um, with us, it, it really started with like trusting the business ethos of each lab. Um, because again, in the beginning on the ground floor, we didn't have numbers to compare to, um, to make sure what we were getting was aligning with other states or things like that. I think that's great advice for other states is to see if the numbers you're getting from your lab make sense with things you're seeing in other states. Um, and they should be able to give you expected ranges for terpene content, for cannabinoid content in your flower and your trim material and in your whatever kind of extract you're producing. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure how you got to the place with lab views. Yeah, we, we do have one lab that we use that we publicize all of our, our analytics um, through, but uh, we did, um, yeah, basically send out tests to multiple different labs and tried to find the one that one was the most transparent with, um, with like methods and how they came to develop their methods. And I, I feel like I have a little bit of an advantage because I do have a chemistry background and I did, you know, run all of these tests myself in school. And we do have an in-house HPLC to validate testing, but um, it is important to have a trusted third party because you have to have a third party per regulation to test your product. 
but also to be able to have that open dialogue um, around making sure that the test is what it says it is. And um, there are some labs that I'm going to back up um, in most industries and in most, yeah, sorry, in most industries, there's standard testing methods developed for the, each testing type. And cannabis does not yet have that. So basically every lab that's entering this space has to create their own method for cannabinoid testing, for pesticide testing, for heavy metals, for terpenes, all of these things. And we're discovering new compounds to test for all the time. And so um, that, that's like a whole can of worms um, because we need standard testing in order to make sure that we are getting access to testing that is validated because the only agencies that are regulating these spaces and these testing um, centers are the agencies that are creating these programs. And I would say that most of these agencies are not qualified to be vetting these labs. And so that's why we're running into these issues where testing labs are not, are, are falsifying data or, um, you know, it's a little bit of a pay to play scenario sometimes. And so that's like a little bit of the ugly side of the industry, but um, we chose the lab that we work with because of that um, transparency that, you know, they share the, the chromatograms with us after the testing, if we would like to see that, or um, if something didn't look right, they will retest product multiple times over. And so it's important to be able to have that relationship with the lab to make sure that, um, they're looking out for the, the science of it and not just, you know, what the customer wants to see. Right. And I mean, you, you mentioned it's a big can of worms, but it's so important to actually open it. And, and it's a conversation that sucks to get into because we drill into consumers' heads, you know, start learning about cannabinoids, start paying attention to terpenes. And then we're also telling them that those numbers may not actually mean anything because they may not be real. Um, and that's, that's just the place we're at. Again, it's a new industry and we need to ask for a lot of patience and understanding from our consumers as we all do this together. Um, so again, like advocating for yourself as a consumer, if you have a farm that you love and trust, asking them why they use the lab they do. Um, and if you're a farm that's getting into this, um, really paying attention to your lab choice and trying to really avoid the ones that seem like they might be a pay to play scenario, because that is very real. And like you said, all these labs are just private businesses who are also making a profit on what they do um, and are incentivized to get more clients to make more profit by offering them higher THC results. And, you know, we, for a while in Washington, saw a whole wave of like 33 to 37% THC numbers in flour, which is in the thing. That's just not <laughs> reality. Um, but you can buy it for a minute. And, you know, there was nothing anyone was doing about it because people didn't understand how that was happening, so. All right, um, I just have to say, as someone that has been in the cannabis industry for like seven years and done a lot in the manufacturing side, you guys blew me away. There was just so much going on. You guys are so experienced. And as Lulu led with, just shout out to the women throughout the supply chain. I think, um, like she said, there's a ton that we see on the kind of the front of the house, but there's some dope women um, in the labs, in the grows, making it happen. And it's just a pleasure to to highlight you guys. So I'm going to switch it, switch the, the topic one more time on you. I, I know we're going a little bit long, but thank you. Thank you for hanging in with us. We have Andrew who's been patiently waiting with his hand up. So those on YouTube, we love you, but you can't ask any questions unless you're in the Zoom. Um, Andrew, I'm going to invite you to talk and, uh, you can ask your question. Let's see here. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. All right. This is exciting. Yeah. I would, uh, reflect, uh, what Joe, uh, Jacoby said, this was definitely one of the best presentations I've seen in, in years and on the rebel always seems to do that, but the, just the wealth of knowledge that you two brought to this conversation in all aspects of building a fantastic and safe and compliant product for the industry um, is just invaluable to anyone that's starting up. Um, I guess I had two questions, one for each of you. They kind of uh, have merged into one question, but uh, low specifically for you in an industry, or I guess a category within the industry that seems so competitive and hard to differentiate like, uh, you know, vape pens and, and concentrates. How do you listen to your consumers? 
how do you understand what they want? And then how do you, you know, build a brand that feels authentic and then, you know, work to build that loyalty within your customer uh, base. And I heard you use headset data. So, you know, props to you for bringing that market intelligence. And then Nicole, my question for you was, uh, I love that you are focused on medicine first within cannabis, which I think is something that we can, you know, never leave in the past. And, you know, it's, it's something that's so important and a, a reason a lot of us got into the industry, myself included. So uh, what are some cannabinoids or terpenes that you are seeking within your cultivars beyond, you know, the basic THC or CBD that a lot of customers, you know, like you said, shop for something that's testing it. 33% or, you know, 57%. What are some other cannabinoids that you're very excited about that have, you know, outstanding benefits that, you know, we're just starting to see research on that you're starting to seek uh, within, you know, the plants that you're growing and, and seeking from uh, genetics. So those are my two questions. Thank you again. Those are great questions. And um, we're going to s- continue to try and figure out how to connect with the consumer and really understand what they're looking for, because most of our states can't have something like a focus group. So um, uh, we've all, you know, heard talk to the bud tenders. I definitely think that that's an important um, conversation to have really like not, what do they use and what are they seeing people asking for? Um, and then on top of that, uh, you know, looking to like your community in general. And um, I did a lot of research, like asking friends of friends, you know, what, what are you looking for in a cannabis product? And there really is, there are really multiple markets that you can look for and, and, and address and really understanding um, which one you're trying to tap into. And so for Halo, we're really looking for, we're really trying to address the consumer that's looking to amplify their experiences in life um, and creating products that help them find that product. So we not only educate on cannabis as a whole and the chemistry behind it and to help you get a better um, experience at the end of the day and a more, be able to make a more informed decision. Um, but also putting that, uh, language on the packaging itself so that consumers can make that decision for themselves, whether that is inspiring the aha moment of, yes, you can have a product that will help you clean your house, or you can have the product that, um, helps you go to sleep at night. Uh, so for me, it, it was, uh, fundamentally understanding the market that we're trying to reach and then polling those people and finding creative ways to do that. And luckily we have the internet (laughs) because it is a really interesting way to connect with the consumer. Um, And that, and being genuine in that space and really focusing on addressing those consumers is the, the only path to success. Um, And then uh, I I do want to jump in on the, the cannabinoid piece. I am a super fan of CBG it's one of my favorite cannabinoids and we'll still, we'll continue to see that market develop because it is actually happiness in a cannabinoid. Um, and so I'll leave it at that, but, um, yeah, just really grateful for that question. Yeah. No, I definitely echo what you said on the market research piece too. And again, for us, it's like looking back to the plant and having an understanding as professionals, not even air quotes, just professional. Um, who have a deeper understanding of the fact that, you know, cannabis can do more than this associated experience of getting you high, right? So it's our responsibility, especially in an emerging market, not to necessarily look to a consumer and ask them what they want, because they don't understand the breadth of experience that's out there. So just providing as much information as we can as to what we can offer and letting people experiment within that and then give us feedback on what they're liking, what they want to see more of. And then we can do research on bringing in cultivars that you know support those categories. Um, and within that, the way um, Lulu mentioned, the way we speak about cannabis is not through indica and sativa. We talk about um, our actual plants as indicas and sativas because those are horticultural terms. They refer to a broad leaf drug cultivar and a narrow leaf drug cultivar, and then hybrids in between. Um, we try to just speak to people directly about experience. So we talk about um, typology of chemovar as how we initially separate our plants. So a type one is a THC dominant. A type two chemovar is a balanced THC CBD ratio. A type three is a CBD dominant. 
The type four is a secondary cannabinoid dominant. So THCV dominant, CBG dominant. We're not seeing a lot of those actually on the market yet, but they're definitely research-based. Um, and then type five is cannabinoid null, which is used you know, specifically in medical research. Whole different thing that we don't really have use for in this market. Um, but we're really interested um, as a company in pursuing this type two space um, within these balanced THC CBD ratios. Um, there's a lot of, you know, myrcene dominant two to one, one to one, three to one, and 20 to one ratios that we see and exploring that, breeding within that, trying to get different terpene, you know, combinations to come out within that has been really interesting. And we actually did just get some genetics um, this past year that um, do not technically legally exist yet, but they are CBG dominant, which is really exciting for you to get to play with later. Hello. Um, and also exploring some THCV dominant strains as well, which again are like barely on the periphery of coming down the pipeline eventually, but understanding also there's so much to play with within these bigger bucket categories as well. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I know we're a little bit over time, so thank you so much, ladies and everyone, um, for uh, joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to get both of you uh, ladies over to the East Coast, um, especially with the way that you guys have always been so ethical and intentional with running your businesses. Um, I think you guys are the type of consultants that um, the, the, you know, the East Coast really needs to think about these things. Lo, I know we connected you with 0.7 for another um, potential uh, extraction processing play. Um, Nicole, excited to get you out here to New York for growing, cultivating, as well as um, product development um, and also merchandising and design and all of those things. I don't think um, people know, like you have, you know, you were the you know designer of one of my favorite brands, Madewell. So, um, so, how can we get a hold of you? Um, I'm going to type in contact info in here for you guys. Um, yes, thank you so much, Lulu. And I just want to echo what On the Revel is all about, which is collaboration and creating access to these uh, educational resources in the right ways. So thank you for what you do. And everybody here listening now and later, um, do connect with us because um, it's important to establish those connect contacts and uh, you never know when the time might be right to work together, so. Right, and even if it's not working together, just staying connected. If you have interest in what's happening in our state, you know, you want links to find out what's happening, happening legislatively, let us know, we can point you in the direction of all of that. But yeah, again, Jacoby and Lulu, thank you so much. Like this is such an invaluable resource for us and for consumers and yeah, for people out there who are trying to get into this world. Thank you both. We seriously appreciate it so much. Thank you to our audience who join us uh, weekly. To the new ones, I hope you really enjoyed all of these gems. To our um, regulars, we can't do it without you. Um, and on that note, I'm going to close it up, but I got to thank Cole Shots because they really took a chance on us two months ago, and we appreciate them. Like I said, with things heating up on the East Coast, if you need an attorney, which you do, you should hit them up. So check out Cole Shots. Um, shout out to the people on YouTube. Shout out to everybody that joined the Zoom. Shout out to our DJ, DJ O. Uh, we love you. We appreciate you. And um, next week, we'll be talking about the retail game. And we have some really dope women um, breaking down uh, dis dis dispensary licenses and how to get rolling. So on that note, thank you all. Thank you, ladies, once again. Oscar, you could take it away, bro. Have a beautiful night.